Good morning and welcome to the Voice of Faith. We're going to be spending the next few Sundays focused on the topic of forgiveness and reconciliation. And the title of this series I got at midnight last night, um, it's called Born Forgiven and Free. We are born forgiven and free. Which was a real revelation for me when I realized that Today we're going to be discussing what forgiveness is and what it is not. <clears throat> God forgave us for all of our sins, our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. And he provided reconciliation for us on his end. Now not all people have received that forgiveness and not all people have been reconciled to him, but he provided it for all people. It's available to anybody who should call for it. And as his children, we too are called to forgive. I believe that there are two major reasons why people don't forgive. I don't believe they're the only reasons, but I believe that there are two major reasons. The first one is, I don't know that people really understand what forgiveness is. I didn't. And the second is, they don't really know how to forgive. So hopefully by the end of this series, we're going to really know how to forgive, and we're going to walk in freedom, and we're going to be able to help other people walk in that freedom. I believe by the end of this series, there are going to be people who not only receive emotional healing, but physical healing connected to the ability to be able to forgive. Amen. This is a series that the Lord put on my heart some time ago. And um, I really believe that he has a word for his people. We're going to start out today, we're going to turn to Hebrews 12. We're going to do verses 14 through 16. Hebrews 12, 14 through 16. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's really tough. This is not eternal salvation. This is our daily relationship with God. We cannot see God or have an intimate relationship with him if we are walking in strife with somebody. Verse 15, look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Resentment and bitterness from unforgiveness become a root that cause us to fail to walk in the grace of God, and it defiles us and makes us unholy. We can't have an intimate relationship when we're defiled and unholy. Grace, remember grace, one definition for grace is getting what we don't deserve, which is forgiveness. We've already received that. And not getting what we do deserve. So bitterness and resentment keep us from being able to walk in that grace. We have to choose, if we choose to live in resentment and bitterness, we open the door to the devil in our life. Mm -hmm. 
I don't want to give the devil any open doors. Amen. I've done enough of that in the past. I'm walking in a new day. Amen. We're not going to turn to this, but Romans 6.16, I'm just going to tell you what it says. You might want to write it down and look it up later. Romans 6.16 says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey. In other words, if you choose to obey the devil, you're going to be his servant. Forgiveness is God's way. Unforgiveness is the devil's way. So we yield ourselves servants to the devil when we choose to walk in unforgiveness. I really appreciate you guys taking notes. We're going to read verse 16 now. Least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Wow, how did Esau get up into all this bitterness and, and uh, resentment? Because Esau bowed to his flesh and gave up his birthright mm -hmm. for his hunger, for his fleshy hunger. When we choose to walk in unforgiveness, we give up our birthright. We are born again, and we have a birthright of intimacy with God. And we give up that birthright to have intimacy with God when we choose to obey the devil in unforgiveness. When we choose to follow our flesh and desire revenge, we give up our daily intimacy with the Lord. When we choose to walk in unforgiveness and we succumb to our flesh wanting to have revenge, we give up our intimate walk with the Lord. But there is good news to that. And the good news is that God loves us so much and he has a covenant with us all we have to do is repent, give our heart back to him, and we are established back into that intimate relationship with him. Amen. That's how good he is. When we are walking in unforgiveness, we are held hostage by our feelings that come from the hurt and the offense. Think about that. When we walk in unforgiveness, we are held hostage by those feelings that come from that hurt and offense. Isn't that right where the devil wants you to be held hostage? He wants to steal your freedom. God is working in my heart. Um, I grew up in a home that taught unforgiveness. There was no forgiveness in my home. And I felt, I grew up feeling condemned and unworthy all the time. And I know that there are people in this church who have had the same experience. And God wants to set you free. Amen. I choose now not to be held hostage by those feelings. When somebody talks badly about me or somebody leaves the church or um, somebody rejects me, I choose to go before God and give that offense to him. And it has to be a choice. It has to be something that you openly, actively do. As long as the devil is in the world, there's going to be evil. And as long as there's evil in the world, we are going to have lots of opportunities for offense and to be hurt. Lots and lots and lots. And I believe that as the days get closer to Jesus coming back, it's going to multiply. Many people are ignorant of the devil's devices, and unforgiveness is one of his devices. 
<clears throat> it opens the door for him to come in and steal what God, the good things that God is doing in your life. Jesus came to give us abundant life, but when we walk in unforgiveness, it opens the door for the devil to come in and steal all those things in our abundant life that God is doing for us. We need to learn to be quick to forgive. And this, this uh, message is really important to me because I was hurt very deeply by somebody that I should have been able to trust. And for years, I walked in bitter, bitterness and anger and hurt, and it consumed me. And I don't want to live that way anymore. And you don't even realize that it's consuming you when you're there. You just walk day to day and, and you're, just, you're just existing in it. You don't see what's happening to you. <clears throat> I think also that if the person who hurt you is somebody that you're supposed to be close to, like a family member, and you have uh, a lot of contact with them, I think that that root grows faster and deeper. But it doesn't really matter how fast or deep it grows. If you let it grow, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take hold of you, and it's going to change your life. Dwayne Sheriff has a saying. He says, I know that you will love me when you forgive me when I fall, and I will fall. That touched my heart because he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. We're all going to fall. But I'm going to know, Adelia, that you love me when I fall and you say, I forgive you. He also has a saying that he says, when I mess up, I fess up. That's tough for me because I grew up in a home where you couldn't mess up. But that's my commitment to you as a leader in this church. When I mess up, I'm going to fess up. I'm going to be swallowing hard because I'm learning how to do it properly. But when I mess up, I'm going to fess up. And when you hurt me, I'm going to choose to forgive you because I love you. <clears throat> we need to be quick to recognize that people make mistakes and we need to be quick to forgive. We need God to forgive us, not just for our initial salvation, but we need him to forgive us every day because we are human and we make mistakes. And again, I do believe that the two biggest reasons that people don't forgive is, number one, they don't know what forgiveness is, and number two, they don't know how. And when I, when I uh, received a revelation of this, it changed my life. And I believe that there's going to be people whose lives are changed through this also. So we're going to start out talking about what forgiveness is not. And um, these were like huge to me. When, when I heard this spoken, I was like, wow. What a freedom I, I got from hearing this. So we're starting out with what forgiveness is not. The first thing it is not is it is not a compromise of morals. Forgiving someone is not a compromise of morals. Boy, I used to think it was. In other words, people think that if they forgive, if I forgive somebody, they will think that what they did to me was okay. That's huge. Man, I used to think that all the time. But if I let it go, if I forgive, they're going to think that the way they treat me is okay. That's not true. Now, the devil may try to make them believe that, but that's not true. <clears throat> An example would be, oh, I can't forgive Aurora. Do you know what she did to me? 
she hurt me really bad, and if I forgive her, she's going to think it's okay to keep treating me that way and treating other people that way. But the truth is, when God forgave me, and when he does forgive me, he doesn't compromise his righteousness or his morals. He doesn't look at me and say, well, Leanne, I'm going to forgive you because what you did really wasn't that bad. It really wasn't too bad. It's really okay. Uh -uh. He forgave me because the sins that I've committed were bad. They were really bad. They weren't what some people would say little sins. I've committed some really bad sins. We've all committed some really bad sins. And God didn't change what he saw as righteousness and moral. He just chose to be merciful and forgive us. And we are to do the same thing. God said, Leanne, insert your own name, I love you so much, and I want a relationship with you so much that I will forgive you because of the work of my son at Calvary. Bill, God loves you so much that no matter what you do, he's forgiven you because he wants a relationship with you. He doesn't overlook our sin. He doesn't change his morals or values. And we don't have to change ours to forgive other people. God pardoned me because I was guilty. And we are to pardon other people because they are guilty. This is good. You never looked more like God than when you are forgiving others. It's not my quote. I wish it was. But you never look more like God than when you are forgiving others. The second thing that forgiveness is not, it is not a violation of justice. Forgiving someone is not a violation of justice. Boy, I used to, I used to think that too. Not a violation of guilt? Justice. Forgiveness is not a violation of justice. If I forgive them, they will be getting away with, uh, with injustice. They'll be getting away with it. I can't let them get away with it. Unforgiveness is you demanding a payment for what they did. Unforgiveness is you demanding a payment for what they did. In today's world, we often see people go into jail for, um, for things that they've done wrong to other people, for hurts that they've done wrong to other people. And when we get hurt or we see our family hurt, we have this need, this fleshy need inside of us to make them pay. We have a need for revenge, but we have been transformed and we have to learn to, to crucify that flesh and walk with in uh, and walk in forgiveness as God has called us to. <clears throat> Me choosing to forgive somebody is not a violation of justice. And here's why. You are justly forgiven and justly released of all your debt because of what Jesus did and paid for you. 
you are justly forgiven and justly re released of all your debt because of what Jesus did for you and paid for you. So me forgiving you is not a violation of justice because Jesus already paid it all. And if I believe that for myself, then I need to believe that for you. My faith in the love of God for me and my faith in his goodness frees me to totally trust him to deal with you when you hurt me. My faith in the love of God for me and my faith in his goodness frees me to trust God to deal with you when you hurt me. That was huge for me. Forgiving me, forgiving someone is not a violation of justice because I am trusting God and his justice. Everybody will someday meet God. Everybody will. If somebody that hurts me is not born again and they don't get their, their lives right with God, you think the summer's been hot here where their going's going to be even hotter. That's justice. I don't need to worry about that. And if somebody who hurt me is born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, someday they're going to meet God. Because the Bible says that we're gonna, there's going to be a time of judgment and we're going to be judged for every idle word that we speak. Okay? I don't have to worry about it. God knows their heart. God knows how to deal with them, and I can just let them go. Okay? There are natural consequences that I already talked about. One of them is when you walk in unforgiveness, you open the door to the devil. When you choose to walk in offense, you're opening the door to the devil. You're choosing to obey the devil instead of God. So there's the consequences that that person is going to have to deal with, and that's between them and God. It's not between me and them and God. I didn't die on the cross for them. Jesus did. He can take care of it. We know that God extended forgiveness to ourselves, to us, and we need to extend that to other people. That's what God calls us to. Okay, next. Forgiveness is not conflict avoidance. Forgiveness is not conflict avoidance. I have been an expert at this in my life. <clears throat> not anymore. But because I grew up feeling so inferior and not acceptable, um, I used to be able to be a scrapper with anybody who was close to me. But anybody who wasn't close to me, man, they could just trod me over and I would just avoid it. And that's not good. Conflict avoidance is not good. It's not how to handle your problems. Um, I used to do this a lot when I worked at my job in teaching. By the time I retired in teaching, I had let so much anger and bitterness build up in me from my job and from the people that I worked with that I was miserable. Amen. And it was conflict avoidance. I chose not to forgive. I chose not to try to reconcile because I didn't know how. And it just grew into this bitterness that was overtaking me. Um, also, when you uh, just pretend that nothing is going on, that's just as bad as just letting it sit in there and, 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 uh, and fester. Thank you. Okay? So some people choose to just let it fester and they don't let go of it. That's bad. But pushing it aside and pretending that nothing happened and that there's no pain, that's just as bad. Either way, you're going to get a bitter root. Okay? That's not the way to handle things. 
We have to learn to forgive and hopefully learn to reconcile with people. Now, we are called to forgive, and I am talking about, uh, right now I'm talking about not just letting things fester and not, and not avoiding things, but we are called to forbear. Forbearance is different than just pretending like nothing happened. Okay? So we are called to forbear. We're going to go to Romans 2, 4. Romans 2, 4. I'm going to start at three just for understanding purposes. And thank and thankest thou this old man that judgest them which do such things and dost the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Okay, here we go. Sir, despisest, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? God. God's forbearance is one of the ways that his love is manifested. Okay? God's forbearance is one of the ways that his love is manifested. So what is forbearance? Forbearance is to spare or to treat with indulgence and patience. Forbearance is to spare or to treat with indulgence and patience. And I looked at that and I thought, well, well, that's good, but what's indulgence? You know, to me, indulgence is when you're like taking in things that you shouldn't take in. <laughs> but that's not the definition of this indulgence. When you look it up, in the old, old dictionary. This indulgent means to remit punishment. So what we could say is that forbearance is to spare other people to remit their punishment and be patient with them. That's what we're called to do. We are called to spare other people to remit their punishment and be patient with them. This verse says, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God's goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering has led and still leads you to repentance. And when we forbear for people, we do the same thing. We lead them to the Lord. We lead them to his goodness. We represent him. If we're born again Christians, we represent God. We're going to turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, please. We're going to do Colossians 3, 13 and 14. Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, two different things, forbearing and forgiving. 
If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also ye do. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So we're called to forbear, which is just to let it go. Just let it go. And to forgive. Forbearance is a sign of maturity in our lives as we walk with Jesus. I'm maturing. I'm really excited. It's not overlooking or pretending that it didn't happen, but it's just choosing to let it go. I really wasn't harmed. I really wasn't hurt. I'm just going to let it go. I got a good example for you. I'm going to use my husband. One of my husband's jobs at home is to do the dishes. Okay, so he does the dishes. It's great. I do the cooking. He does the dishes. But sometimes he puts things away in the wrong spot. And I'll be trying to cook, and I can't find what I need. And it doesn't do any good to ask him, because most of the time he can't remember where he put it anyway. But am I really hurt by that? No. No, I'm not really hurt by that. I haven't really been wronged. It hasn't really hurt my feelings. It's just inconvenient and annoying. So I need to choose to forbear. I can either kindly ask him and hope that he knows where it is, or I can just keep looking. Usually it's not too hard to find. But that's an example of when you would forbear. But if he does something that really hurts me, then I move from forbearance to forgiveness. That's a whole different ballgame. Okay? We have to choose to recognize that people make mistakes, and we have to choose to forbear. Jesus chose to forgive people that have false faults, weaknesses, and that just mess up. He chose to forgive people with faults, weaknesses, and those who just mess up. Guess what? That's you and me. Amen. He chose to forgive us. We need to choose to forgive and forbear for others. Um, and this, this is not only in just our families or in our marriages. I mean, marriage is huge. Guys, when you live with somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's lots of opportunities to forbear and forgive. But it's also with our children. It's with our jobs. It's with our church. That's one thing that we need to really be um, aware of. When people come to church... As this church grows, there's going to be people who come in who say and do things that hurt us. Your leadership, us, you guys are leaders, but us also, we're going to do things that hurt you, not because we intend to, but because we're human. And we need to learn to forbear and forgive because that's what God calls us to. Remember that the word says that love covers a multitude of sins. When we forbear or we forgive, we're walking in love, and we cover that sin. The next thing that forgiveness is not. The next thing that forgiveness is not. I didn't count these, so I can't tell you what number it is. I'm sorry. Forgiveness is not trust. This is number four. Forgiveness is not trust. You said trust? Trust. Forgiveness is not trust. That was another thing. If I forgive them, then I have to trust them. No, you don't. Okay? One time someone in my family stole some money from me. It took me a long time to be able to trust them. I'm still not sure that I really do. But I can forgive them but I don't have to trust them. If somebody has physically or emotionally abused children and they're in the church, we don't give them a position of responsibility over children. We can forgive them, but we don't have to trust them. They have to go through the process of proving that they can be trusted. And we are supposed to give them that opportunity. 
but we don't have to trust them until they've showed us that they have a change of heart. When people in our church sin, and, and I'd never thought about this before, but when people in our church sin, whether it's a private sin, meaning something like it's something that happened in their family, or it's a sin that's very public, for instance, an, an affair. The person that they've hurt needs to forgive them, but as a church body, we need to forgive them also. And we need to think about that because, again, as this church grows, there's going to be people who come in here and make mistakes. But what they've done is wrong. It's hurt the church and it's hurt the ministry of Jesus, and we have to choose to forgive them. And we have to try to help them to reconcile. And we have to give them the opportunity to prove that they can be trusted. Okay, here's number five. Forgiveness is not forgetting. How many of you have heard, well, I'll know that you've forgiven if you forget what happened? Has anybody ever heard that? I heard that. I used to believe that. Not true. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Okay, I grew up in some really rough situations. And there are things that happened to me that I will never be able to forget. Because we have a brain that's designed for memory. We don't just all of a sudden become amnesiacs when we choose to forgive somebody. But what does happen is that when we choose to forgive and we allow God to work in us and to bring us healing, that memory goes from the forefront of our mind to the back of our mind. Amen. It's no longer in the forefront dominating our future and stealing our destiny, but it's moved to the back so that we have to really think about it in order to call, recall it up. Okay, so you don't have to become an amnesiac to forgive somebody. We're going to turn to Philippians 3 for a little example. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. This is Paul speaking. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Was Paul an amnesiac? He went through stoning. He was left for dead. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. And when he went up to testify as a Christian, he recounted all of that stuff. And yet he says here to forget. He's talking about not letting those things be in the forefront of your mind, but focus on the prize that comes through Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. It's, forgiveness is not about forgetting. It's about focusing on something else. Okay? Forgiveness means you have forgotten to the point that you are no longer held in bondage to your past or to the wrongs that people have done to you so you can re reach your destiny. I'm going to say that again for those who'd like to write it down. Forgiving means you have forgotten to the point that you are no longer held bondage. Forgiving means you have forgotten to the point that you are no longer held bondage to your past 
or to the wrongs people have done to you. so that you can reach your destiny. Forgiveness means you have forgotten to the point that you are no longer held in bondage to your past or to the wrongs that people have done to you so you can reach your destiny. There's freedom in this because now once you've forgiven, you're able to walk in the love of God and trust Him. And the last one, forgiveness is not... I haven't said. Forgiveness is not the absence of pain. Forgiveness is not the absence of pain. However, forgiveness will start the process of healing the pain and the hurt. You can be crying because you're so hurt and yet you can choose to forgive. I've heard uh, people who've done a lot of counseling say, they hear a lot, um, do you know what they did to me? How can I forgive them? Do you know what they did to me? Do you know how bad they hurt me? But I want you to think about this. Think about Jesus. Think about what our sin did to him. He was rejected. He was humiliated. He was mocked. He was beaten. Beaten to where he was close to death. He had that crown of thorns shoved on his head. He was crucified. He went to hell. And he dealt with the devil. He did all that. And yet while he was hanging on the cross, in Luke 23, 34, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't think anything that we've endured, even though sometimes we think what we've endured is pretty painful, I don't think anything we've endured is close to what Jesus endured. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So you can forgive when you're in the midst of pain. I do want to give you a word of warning, though. Because if you're feeling pain, it makes you vulnerable to the devil. Okay? Your pain makes you a target for his lies and deceit. So if you are in pain, you need to be sitting at the feet of Jesus every day, sometimes several times a day, and giving that pain to him and just letting God love on you. Because you don't want to succumb to the devil in your pain. That's right. You need to do just like Philip was talking about this morning. Speak to your mountain. You need to speak to your mountain, speak to your pain, and tell it to, become, to leave so it won't become a stumbling block. And also, um, another good thing to do is to meditate. Meditating on the word is always good. But let's turn to Isaiah 53. And I know that most people in this church know this scripture because we uh, refer to it a lot. But I want to bring it out because it specifically addresses this. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, talking about Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
So just like Jesus bore our sickness and disease, and by faith we receive healing, he also bore our pains and sorrows, and by faith we receive our emotional healing. How do you do that? Talk to your mountain, sit at the feet of Jesus, meditate on this word. Um, I also ask God to help me see the people that have hurt me through his eyes. When I look at someone who's hurt me, I see them through the lens of pain until that pain is gone. But if I ask the Lord to help me see them through his eyes, then I see them through the lens of love. And that helps me to forbear. That helps me to let go of that pain and to love them because I'm, I'm walking in that love that God has for them. We should forgive people even before they repent. When I heard this, I was like, what? But think about it. Jesus provided forgiveness for us. God forgave us. 2,000 years ago through Jesus. God put all of our sin on Jesus. Jesus took the punishment for all of our sins. So we were forgiven 2,000 years ago. But we don't always receive that forgiveness. Well, we didn't receive it 2,000 years ago. We didn't receive that forgiveness until we repented. There's people out there who have never repented They've not received that forgiveness, but it's still there for them. So we are to be like God, and we are to forgive people. If Nelson hurts me, it is my calling from God to immediately forgive him. And then if he comes to me and he repents, my answer to him is, Hey, Nelson, I already forgave you. It's okay. So that he can receive that forgiveness. But for my sake and for God's sake, I forgive him at the time that he hurts me. But for his sake, I tell him that he's already forgiven so that he can receive that forgiveness. He may never come and repent to me, but I've already forgiven him just like God's already forgiven us. God's already forgiven us for all of our future sins, whether we know that we've done them or not. They've all been forgiven. And when we come to recognize that we've sinned, all we have to do is just receive what God's already provided. And we need to do the same for others. That may be something that we need to do on a regular basis if somebody who has hurt us is somebody that we spend a lot of time with. Okay? Again, the, the more contact you have with them, the more hurt that there can be, and the greater that root will become if you don't deal with it. And unfortunately, when that root develops, again, it makes it harder for you to walk in the love of God and to walk in intimacy with God. So we have spent most of our time talking about what forgiveness is not. So what is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Going the wrong way in my Bible. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read verses 9 through 15. Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 15. So this is Jesus, and he's, in, he's giving instruction on how to pray. And he says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, O Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So there's two different words here in this scripture that I want to talk about. And the first one is trespass. He says, if you forgive others' trespasses, then your Father will forgive you your trespasses. What is a trespass? It's an injury or an offense done to another. Okay, a trespass is any injury or offense done to another. So if you forgive somebody when they have offended you or injured you, then God will forgive you. Again, this is not eternal salvation. This is your daily walk, your intimacy with God. Um, and I also want to look at the word debt, because it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And to us, a debt is when we owe money or somebody owes us money. But what this debt means is a sin or a trespass or a guilt or a crime that renders someone liable to us. So in other words, a debt is when you've done something to me that has hurt me or injured me and makes you liable to me for some reason. Revengeance. Revenge. Vengeance? Revenge? I'm trying to put the two words together. That's what some people see as a liability when they're hurt. You owe me, I'm going to get revenge. Okay? So what exactly is forgiveness? Forgiveness is to release someone of their debt. Forgiveness is to release someone for their debt to us. A debt is what we see that they owe us when they've injured or offended us. If we don't forgive their debt, God's not going to forgive our debt. Not eternal salvation. And by the time this series is over, we're going to go and investigate that and tell you why I believe that. Um, but it is our day-to-day -day intimate walk with God. Forgiveness and reconciliation are two very, very important things to God. He gave his son so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to him, and it's very, very important to him that we walk in that. Reconciliation is not always possible. We're going to talk more about reconciliation later. But forgiveness is always possible. We can always choose to forgive somebody of their debt to us. For the sake of time, we're not going to go here, but Mark 11:25 says the same thing, that if you forgive their trespasses, God will forgive you. But if you don't forgive their trespasses, he won't forgive you. So that's just verification. Again, later on in this series, we're going to dig into those deeper. Um, for right now, we are going to look at Colossians 3.13. Colossians 3.13. It says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so ye do also. So we are called to do the same thing that Christ did. It 
Then in 14 it says, And above all these things put on charity, charity is love, which is the bond of perfectness. And I looked at that, love is the bond of per perfectness. Well, love, you're not walking in love when you're unforgiving. Okay, that's important. And what does it mean to be the bond of perfectness? And to narrow it down, I came down to the bond um, of perfectness is love cements us or binds us to a life with the greatest amount of goodness and holiness. Okay? Love is important. It binds us to a life with the greatest amount of goodness and holiness. Isn't that what we're seeking? We're seeking to be like Christ. <clears throat> we want to be good and we want to be holy. And love is what binds us to that life. If we're walking in unforgiveness, we're not walking in love. Okay? We're going to turn uh, now to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 21 and 22 to start out. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. So this is where Jesus is talking to the disciples. And Peter says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. So here's Peter and he's looking for that magic number. That magic number that how many times do I have to forgive him before I can just nail him? That's our flesh. And what did Jesus say? He said in verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. What's 70 times seven? 490. Is there anybody you know that is going to sin against you 490 times? Yes? <laughs> then you need to learn to walk in forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> She's keeping count. <laughs> forgive him. Uh, that's right. You got to forgive him. <laughs> what Jesus is really saying there is it doesn't matter how many times. You need to just forgive them. I'm sure Peter wasn't truly excited about that, but that's the way it is. Right after that, in verse 23, Jesus gives us the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, I don't know if that's the technical name for this parable, but that's what I'm calling it. It's a parable about an unforgiving servant, and we're going to read that parable. So we're going to start in 23, and he's teaching, There is the kingdom of heaven, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I did some research trying to find out how much 10,000 ta talents would be in today's world. It was really hard because different people said different things. But uh, back in 2011, I found some numbers that I thought, okay, we know it's probably worth more, but the whole reason I'm giving you these numbers is so you can make a comparison. So we're going to say that 10,000 uh, talents is worth about $3 billion. So this king, back in 2011, would have forgiven his servants for a debt of about $3 billion. He must have been pretty rich to be able to give, forgive a debt that big. <clears throat> but for as much as he had... Not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So, the, so this Lord is still saying, this king is still saying, I want you to pay me 
your debt of $3 billion. But the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Okay, he's got $3 billion worth of debt. I'm going to do everything I can to pay thee, Lord. Just give me time. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him that debt. Isn't that just like God? Yeah, we could never pay back all the debt that we owe. But he forgave him that $3 billion debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. Well, how much is a hundred pence? It's about $5,000. So he was forgiven $3 billion, but he won't forgive his fellow servant 5000 And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, three billion dollars, because you desirest from me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. God forgave you of your debt, and he requires you to forgive others of their debt. For some people, that debt could be something like, you know, you need to pay me money for what you did to me. For other people, it could be a debt of just an apology. It doesn't matter what you consider their debt to be. You are to forgive that debt, which means we, I can't even require Philip when he hurts me. I cannot require him to apologize to me. Now, he can choose to apologize to me, but if I am walking in what God calls me to, I cannot require him to apologize to me because then I'm not forgiving him his debt and I'm walking in unforgiveness. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? That's really eating at our flesh because our flesh says, no, you owe me. But God says, no, they don't. Because all of their debt, all of their sin, all of their trespasses was put upon Jesus. Just like yours was, just like mine was. All of my debt and sin was placed upon Jesus. So was his. Unforgiveness is demanding payment for what someone else has done to us. Unforgiveness. Are you back to unforgiveness now? I'm going to give you a definition. Unforgiveness is demanding payment for what someone else has done to us, whether it's restitution or even an apology. Unforgiveness is demanding payment for what someone else has done to us, whether it's restitution or even an apology. But forgiveness is the releasing of debt. Nobody owes me anything. I find myself thinking that a lot. Nobody owes me anything. I choose to release that person, that pain, that hurt to God, and I trust that person and that pain to a God who is just, he is morally right, and he will do what's right out of a pure heart. For me, when I'm seeing through the lens of my natural eyes, I don't have that pure heart, but God does. 
And there is good news because even though I may be walking in pain, Psalm 23, 3 says that he restores my soul. We know that verse. Psalm 23, 3, he restores my soul. Take that to the feet, to the feet of Jesus. Jesus, you restore my soul. I receive that. And Psalm 51.10, we're not going to go there but for the sake of time, but Psalm 51.10 says that God will change my soul. He'll change me, which is healing, if I'm in the Word and trusting Him. So we got to be in the Word. Nobody owes me anything. My kids, I raised them for years, put them first. Unfortunately, I even put them before God because I didn't know any better. But I've put them first, and today, they don't spend a lot of time with me. But you know what? They don't owe me anything because I did it because I love them. Okay, church, when I do things for you, you don't owe me anything because I do it because I love you. When you're at your job, when you're dealing with the people that you have to deal with, you do it because you love them and because God loves them. They don't owe you anything. I believe, and this is something for, for some people to think about, but it's also something that you're going to find a time to share this whole subject on forgiveness. You're going to need it because there's people out there who are hurting. But I also believe that if you have an anger issue, the root of your problem is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness stirs up that anger and people can't control it. If you have an anger issue, the root of your problem is unforgiveness. So we're just going to do a little recap. You can write down what you want to, but it's just a little recap of what we've discussed. Forgiveness is not the compromising of morals. It is not a violation of justice. It is not conflict avoidance. And forgiveness does not mean that I have to trust someone who has hurt me. It does not mean that I have to become an amnesiac and totally forget what's happened. And it is not the absence of pain. But if I am in pain, I need to be spending time with God, receiving the healing for that pain so that I don't become in bondage to it. Forgiveness is the releasing of debt. It is releasing the debt of people. They owe me nothing. The reasoning of debt is accomplished by giving the debt and the person to God and letting him deal with them. Debt is also released by trusting God to justly deal with them. Okay, I have to be able to trust God that he's going to deal with them. And he's going to deal with them with a pure heart. I choose to walk in peace and love towards all men by forbearing and seeing them through the lens of love, seeing them through God's eyes. I need to stay in the word and receive revelation on just how much God loves me. If you stay in the word and you allow God's love to fill you up, then you can walk in faith trusting him. And you can receive your forgiveness and you can, receive, and you can forgive others. God loves you so much that he placed all your sin on Jesus and has already forgiven you for everything, past, present, and future. He forgave you of a $3 billion debt. We should be able to forgive others of a $5,000 debt. Take the time to meditate on forgiveness and debt. Take the time to reflect on what God has forgiven you of, not through the lens of 
guilt and condemnation, but through the lens of, okay, God, I want to recognize how much you love me so I can be filled with that love and it can flow out into others. Choose to see God's love for others as he loves you. And remember that keeping peace allows you to have an intimate relationship with God. We want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming and hearing this word. We pray that you have a good week. And remember, be not afraid, only believe.